please welcome Chief Technology Officer, Sony Group Corporation, Hiroaki Kitano. Well, good morning, everyone. And thank you for joining me. It's a great privilege to be here with you. Well, I used to attend the uh, academic conference like a AAAI, HKI, and New Ribs, and Dota AI conference, and robotics conference like ICRA, IROS, and RoboCap. But actually, I have to confess that this is the very first time for me to be at the SIGGRAPH. So I'm very excited to be here, and I'm very honored to be a part of SIGGRAPH. I'm also excited because, as you may know, like we are here launching a new event called Sony Creators Conference. We want to showcase and explore what's possible at the intersection of creativity and technology across all types of entertainment in films, animation, games, and beyond. We are looking at how creativity and technology overlap and influence each other how emerging technologies inspire creators, and how they spark new form of entertainment. You know, those are actually exactly the same theme I pursue in my own career as well. And ambitious project, which I uh, uh, engaged, and one example is this eyeball, the robot I helped create for Sony. The first generation of eyeball came out in 1999. I was one of four members of the initial phase of the IBO project. As you can imagine, 30 years ago, robotics wasn't where it is today. And this is me 30 years ago, so well, anyway. Uh, we didn't think that we could build a uh, robotic system that could effectively carry out precise tasks in an open and unstructured environment and guarantee that the robot would do this and that. But we did think that we could create a robot that people could play with it and make people happy. So we came up with the idea of an entertainment robot. And the problem is that we just couldn't figure out what it should look like. So one early prototype, we had a six leg. And it was based on the subsumption architecture of the Rodney Brooks at MIT, as you may uh, remember. Well, but still, we knew a prototype wasn't quite right. I mean, it looks like a, a huge robotics insect or bug. And uh, you know, we improved that. It looks like a pretty well done robotics bug. So imagine that like, uh, you know, Sony, you know, a newspaper might run a story, Sony announcing the robotics insect, and which probably not a good product launch. So we got to uh, uh, decide to uh, pivot to a robot with the full legs. And then our impression was completely different. When it moves, it was very cute, dynamic, and animated. It looks like a puppy. So in prototype, we worked on the framework of changing the shape of the body without need for the powering off for the rebooting. What you're looking at is a full leg robot, like this is a prototype, and then it's removing a leg and changing the wheel. And now the program reconfigure itself in what the shape of the, uh, himself or herself, and then they keep doing this like a chasing uh, uh, ball as well. So this is like a you know, hot plug and play feature, which we actually uh, uh, implemented uh, 30 years ago. Also, we got the uh, eyeball running uh, as well. And this is the, uh, uh, some uh, slow motion uh, video of the eyeball running. You have uh, you've noticed a slight different uh, control architecture and up and down, and then the one is actually uh, you know, uh, moving really fast. And uh, we didn't put in the products, but like, uh, we did uh, all kind of uh, new technologies to make Lobo really configurable and uh, high performance, like uh, running around. At the end, I was released with the uh, cutting edge technology, such as distributed operating system, hot plug and play, and open air standard interface, and uh, other technologies. That was really the state of the art at the time. Now, today, we revived Ivo. There's a new generation of Bible created by the new team with the latest technologies, including various Sony sensors, deep learning, and all that. And it continues to entertain people and make them happy. Now, similar to the tremendous evolution of robotics, another area that made great progress is computing. 
Uh, when I was in Carnegie Mellon University, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, in late 80s to early 90s, I was trying to develop the natural language processing system to enable the real-time spoken language translation. Now at that time, instead of taking a traditional syntactical uh, model, I decided to use a very large data set, a corpus of thousands of sentences with a spoken language trainer system, including a DAPA travel planning uh, corpus. Uh, well, some of you may be uh, aware, you know, back in the uh, 90s. And developed a massive parallel computer to run it. Uh, even developed 256 CPU modified hypercube machines with the University of Southern California based on the project because the uh, project required a lot of computing. I also used the uh, CM2 connection machine, the Thinking Machine Corporation at that time. Well, that seems big enough at that time, 30 years ago, and people so say, that, wow, this is huge. But now compared with the, uh, uh, today, compared to today's uh, large language model, the scalable data and the computing power that I deployed at the time is peanuts. Today we're talking about terabytes of data and truly massive computing power. Well, I believe the data and computing power will play an essential role in next generation creativity and entertainment as well. They'll help creators to fully realize their visions. And because Sony is a side of creators, whenever we explore a new technology, our priority is to make sure they empowered creativity in an ethical and responsible way. That will never change. We want to enable more people to access to better creative tools and to elevate creativity with innovations. To do this, one of the uh, first steps, uh, well, one of many you know, things we did, like one of the things we did, uh, which is significant for us, was we created a new research organization four years ago. Uh, we called it Sony AI. The aim is to create cutting edge technology of strategic importance. Now, above all, we're working to develop technology that unleash human imaginations and creativity. One of the first projects involved taking a new look at the PlayStation game Gran Turismo. You're gonna hear a lot about Gran Turismo today, but those who never play the Gran Turismo, it's a hyper-realistic driving simulator. It's really real. And a game gave us an opportunity to develop the superhuman agent that could learn to drive competitively from the uh, scratch without much human interventions. So we wanted to develop an intelligent system capable of controlling simulated vehicle and push them to the limit in the competitive environment. And we hope to create an agent capable of computing with the best human drivers. What you're looking at is a scenery from the uh, Gran Turismo, and then, uh, this is a, a training session uh, as well, and this is a, a racing session, actually. It's the, uh, all the white one is like a human driving car. This is a Yamanaka is one of the best drivers in the world, and this is a, a red one, it, uh, that's orange one, it's Sophie Orange. That is the autonomous agent we trained and we built. You know, to train it, we use the uh, novel reinforcement learning algorithm called uh, QRSAC, or a quantile regression soft actor critic, and that was developed by our team. And we built a system called DART, or Distribute Asynchronous Rollout and Training, because we need a distributed learning and a massive computing cluster. That allowed us to access the Sony Interactive Entertainment PlayStation Cloud infrastructure. It's unlocked access to the cluster, more than 1,000 PlayStation 4 console. And as you're looking at this, uh, this is like a how, what is happening inside, just visualizing this. A lot of Gran Turismo, different play, different run, different race environment, different parameters of the autonomous agent, and they get the result. I mean, this is what's going on and behind the scene of the uh, GT Sophie and the Gran Turismo autonomous agent. And uh, to train an agent, uh, you know, we learned a lot uh, from this uh, project. And uh, to train an agent, uh, we developed a mixed scenario approach well, some of you might think that the uh, so-called self-play, as used in uh, DeepMind AlphaGo, uh, may actually take care of it, enable the racing agent to compete against each other and get faster. We tried that. I found it that doesn't work. So the reason is the agent try, you know, trained with the self-play approach be less prepared for the, uh, uh, against like, unpredicted human driver's uh, behavior. For example, well, minor mistake might cause the car to spin out and your own car may be affected. Uh, what well, it all mean that this uh, autonomous agent car will be affected. Uh, you have to be involved in an accident, or you have to slow down at the corner. Okay, so this is affected by, uh, you know, uh, by the uh, uh, human mistake. And that kind of scenario, the agent might get involved in the, uh, or the accident. 
and then uh, racing is not zero sum game. And that kind of uh, uh, you know, event doesn't really happen very often. So we have to amplify uh, that event and get the scenario so that the agent will be trained on the, that kind of scenario as well. And if you uh, look at the, oh, can, can you go back like uh, you know, one uh, slide back? Like, uh, uh, you, okay, uh, yeah, uh, like one more. Uh, yeah, so those actually is kind of example of the scenarios. So for example, like uh, this solo is doesn't really work okay. I mean, this is outside is actually overtake from the outside of the lane, and in the fake and inside, like opponent cards are kind of fake move, and they have to like overtake from the inside uh, racing lane as well. So like uh, this kind of scenario uh, doesn't really happen very often uh, in actual racing, and particularly if you do the self play, it's getting it's kind of harder to actually get this kind of thing, and also like uh, involved in a uh, kind of mistake and. Uh, because like a self uh, play means like a both agents get better and better. So this is likely to make say, mistake, but like in a human driver, you know, people make mistake. Okay, so uh, also, uh, you know, to compete, you need a continuous real-time decision making, and you need to follow the unwritten rule of sportsmanship. You know, can play uh, next one, yeah. So what you are looking at is this is like a really competitive environment. You're gonna go aggressively to uh, overtake an opponent's uh, car, you know, competing cars, but uh, still, you, you have to, adhere with the uh, sportsmanship. So you can't really go too aggressive. And uh, that's something uh, we have to do uh, with the uh, kind of soft rules and then uh, uh, something uh, uh, we actually managed to uh, have agent to learn how to behave. Now with the training that GT Sophie learned to outperform human racers in the conventional racing tracks. You know, it was, uh, uh, it was really great. And we also tried a GT Sophie in the off-road environment or dirt environment to see how versatile the technology is. So this is like a, a you know, a scene from the uh, dart course, and we found out GT Sophie outperformed human drivers in this environment in the big margins, even more than on the conventional track. So this proved the versatility of the technology we built for this. One interesting thing we observed, though, is that the human player gets better and better with racing against GT Sophie. The reason is that the human learn from and get inspired the way GT Sophie drives. Then it quickly adapted and improved the skill. And I think this is a really amazing human creative capability. And uh, we believe that kind of uh, discovery can help us explore other dimension of our creativity. And I think we can come up with like, a specific example of uh, this uh, uh, case of the uh, GT Sophies and the human driver as a different trajectory going into the curve and uh, coming out. You know, if you, you know, this is the kind of actual racing scene and this is a trajectory, you see the slight difference on the trajectory, like uh, all the GT Sophie come closer to the uh, inside the uh, driving lane and they go uh, outside and coming in very closely and apex, and then a human driver come uh, touch inside and they go to the outside racing lane. So, you know, after like uh, uh, this uh, GT Sophie actually take a slightly different uh, trajectory uh, racing lane, uh, from the uh, best human drivers, and the human driver obviously noticed that they adapted their uh, tactical maneuver in uh, uh, all the uh, curve entrance and exit, so the actual performance improved. I think this is really important that the uh, technology we build is not really just outperforming humans, but human capability is improved by looking at this agent. So this is kind of interesting symbiosis that they, uh, we need really capable agent to be able to improve the capability of the human, uh, human being as well. So this is really interesting. And then all the detail of those technologies has been published in the uh, cover story of the uh, February 22 issue of the Nature magazine. So you might wanna uh, take a look at it. Then this year, we released our racing agent for, for a month in a Gran Turismo 7 upgrade. So actually, the yeah, people can actually play against the GT Sophie. And the gamers around the world could enjoy the uh, challenge of competing against superhuman racing agent. We'll build it, make the game more exciting and fun for players. Now, our research team is working hard to implement the permanent version of GT Sophie in the game. And they're also partnering with a number of PlayStation Studios to develop a new technology that enables game developers to create even more exciting experiences. Well, now the Sony strengths in the technology extend into the real world as well. Sony is a global leader in imaging and sensing technology that capture the physical world with high precision. In value, over the half of world's image sensors are Sony brand. 
They are used to be on the uh, all sort of camera. They are using all sort of cameras uh, from a smartphone to cinematography, and they support your creative endeavor. Our unique intelligent vision sensor, IMX500, is equipped with the on chip edge side image process capability to enable creative solutions. Understanding the real world through the advanced vision system opens new avenue for all innovations. We also developed a new integrated pro uh, computing platform to augment our vision sensing technology. It's called Atorius. And it's a full stack software layer and cloud environment. And I think one of the things Sony can offer to the creators community is a range of technology from the sensors to motion capture to production capability in the virtual space. When those technologies are combined, they will reinforce each other, and they will bring new possibilities to all kinds of creators. Well, in this way, we connect the real world with the uh, virtual world. So like a real world, virtual world, and the large scale model to combine them together. And this double fly whale is the core of the Sony technology that brings the interesting uh, capability to creators and empower creators. Well, most recently, we announced a partnership with Raspberry Pi. Okay. I'll say one more thing, I guess. You know, here, this is the iMac 500 mounted on the Raspberry Pi. And this is a compact and a versatile module for anyone to play with and to come up with a range of applications of all kinds. Our creation, you know, collaborations enable the easy access to our intelligent vision sensing technology for the Raspberry Pi community with millions of users and developers across the world. Well, when it comes to creativity, we believe that everyone benefits when creators and technologies uh, come together in the community. And what we hope to do, our part, is to build a community with our Sony Creators Conference. And this is our first year, and it's just the beginning. We want to create a community of people who work at the interaction of technology and creativity. We want to build a future of entertainment together with you. At Sony, we take the expansive view on the future creators. It's artists of all kinds, animators, graphic artists, filmmakers, musicians, and game developers. And it's also innovators, designers, entrepreneurs, engineers, and scientists, because they also create a future. We are all creators, and a creator is anybody who challenges the status quo to create something new. And Sony is a company of creators, and we are a creative entertainment company that makes game, music, film, animation, and more. Since we are creators ourselves, every technology we build is designed to empower creators of all kinds. We are here for creators. With that, I would like to invite some of the top creators across the Sony group to talk about how technology impacts creativity. You learn about Spider-Man across the uh, Spider-Verse with their groundbreaking animation style, and God of War with its epic storytelling, and you hear from the creators of Gran Turismo, which has been pushing the front possible in the computer graphics for 25 years, and you go behind the scene in upcoming feature film, Gran Turismo, which is based on the true story, and will be released in North America in a few weeks. Well, actually, a couple of days ago, I watched the preview, and that's a great movie. It's a story about the passions and obsessions and believe himself and make dream come true. You gotta watch it. It's good, okay? Now, let me turn over to the stage to some incredible creators from across the Sony, and hope you enjoy learning how technology you know, powers the creativity in their own work. Well, thank you very much. Please welcome Chief Technology Officer, Sony Pictures Imageworks, Mike Ford. Well, good morning, and thank you, Katana-san, uh, for having Sony Pictures Imageworks here uh, at the Sony Creators Conference. Let's run it. The push for creative exploration in feature and visual effects projects has challenged Sony Pictures Imageworks' team of creative and technical artists throughout its 30-plus year history. As partners in the filmmaking process, 
We have often had creatives show up at our doors with ideas that push the boundaries of what is possible. From elaborate concept designs to loose sketches on a napkin, those initial conversations offer the truest form of creative expression and vulnerability. And it's a powerful and thrilling period of any project where the creative is pulling back the curtain on the story and the visual expectations of the film. And in the moments, creators, I want this pitch, we often hear the yearning for something unique and something never seen before. And at Sony Pictures Imageworks, it is our goal and ultimately our purpose of that initial ask with curiosity and resolve and those unquestionable pangs of doubt that come with any leap of faith. And one of the finest examples of these leaps of faith were our initial conversations with our filmmaking partners at Sony Pictures Animation back in around 2015 when Phil Lord and Chris Miller pitched to us this idea of making an animated Spider-Man movie. But not just any animated Spider-Man movie, they wanted a movie that felt like it was ripped directly from the pages of a comic book. And at Imageworks, we had labored for decades to try and master the art of creating characters and environments that were uniquely stylized, but never at this scale, diversity, and never across an entire film. And so energized and honestly terrified by the initial design reference, we ventured forth to build the Spider-Verse world. So we started we really did. We started with the most complex object we could think of, a simple traffic cone. And born from this idea of this simple cone was the idea of how even these seemingly insignificant objects needed to match the level of style in the film. And from that creative and technical springboard, a movie was mashed, wrestled, and coerced into existence and released in 2018 to rave reviews and critical acclaim. That's all it is, Miles. A leap of faith. But what about the next leap? Oh, overall, it felt like the initial creative goals had been met. But what about the next leap of faith? What was initially asked for, and being very true to its title, is that we would find ourselves building worlds across the Spider-Verse exploring and visualizing the looks of six unique locations and building 600 new characters that inhabited these worlds. And we had taken what we had learned from the first go around with our non-photorealistic rendering and animation tool sets, but the new worlds presented challenges beyond the scope of the tools that we had built on the first movie. And in this film's vast expansion of visual complexity, we needed to reinvent our incline tools for characters like the Vulture. And we needed to find new ways to simulate brushes and moving watercolors for the reflective and mood-enhancing scenes in Gwen's world. We also needed to develop new ways of animation visualization for characters like Spider-Punk and countless other tools that allowed our artists to paint the canvas of the worlds. And in the end, we built more in-house Sony tools on this project than any other project in our history. And it is through this process of exploration and discovery, working alongside our talented software teams, brilliant artists, and demanding creative partners, that the spontaneous mix of art and technology is blended together. Films like Across the Spider-Verse challenge the assumptions of what is possible, push our technical capacity, and ultimately answer the creative yearning for something new, unique, and never seen before. Thank you. Please welcome Director, Product Development at Sony Santa Monica Studio, Megan Morgan Huinio. Thank you. The history of the God of War franchise at Santa Monica Studio has always been about pushing technology to realize an innovative creative vision. When we reimagined God of War in 2018, we strove to evolve how games deliver narrative storytelling. Traditionally, video games use camera cuts to allow for storytelling, setting changes, and gameplay hints. 
For God of War in 2018, our creative director, Corey Barlog's vision was to shoot the entire game in one shot. This pulled players into the action as if in a documentary and immersed them in the storyline. It also created more empathy for the characters and a far more immersive experience for players. To realize this vision, we partnered with the team at PlayStation Studios Visual Arts and PlayStation Studios Motion Capture to create a virtual camera setup and the corresponding technology to allow us to treat the camera like a physical object. The single shot narrative delivery in God of War 2018 was transformative for storytelling in games and for our franchise. It became a key component of how the narrative story is told and experienced by players. We achieved huge success with God of War in 2018 and the reception from players around the world was phenomenal and also very humbling. We were determined to keep pushing the industry forward when we embarked on a follow-up, God of War Ragnarok. Game director Eric Williams' vision for that game challenged our team to evolve on its predecessor and deliver an experience that was once again unexpected and remarkable for players. We asked, how do we evolve our cinematic storytelling to push the envelope even further while building on the innovation of the no-cut camera approach. We had far more characters on average in our scenes than in God of War 2018. And that forced us to spend a lot more time framing the virtual camera and moving characters around differently. Continuing our intimate documentary style camera work, our team was able to create custom buttons on the virtual camera, allowing the camera operator to select lenses and to trigger environmental prop movement directly from the camera. We were also able to allow for a virtual offset of the operator so that if a scene was happening in a tight or a crowded space, the operator could be standing to the outside and the camera would still appear as if it was in the middle of the action, really pulling players into the performance. We leaned heavily on film camera work to understand how to frame shots for disk space, considerations, and hardware performance and how to more intentionally choreograph scenes so that we saw how characters come into and exit the scenes more efficiently. Oh, and by the way, we were figuring all of this out in the middle of a global pandemic, adhering to all of the COVID protocols that were in place at the time as well. With multiple storylines and gameplay allowing players to visit all nine Norse realms in Ragnarok, there were pivotal story moments that required transitions across large distances between realms as your controllable character switches between characters and between their waking reality and dreams. Our team's challenge was to figure out how to realize these transitions without camera cuts while still preserving the intimate documentary style connection to our characters that we had established in the 2018 game. It took a cross-departmental team of experts from all disciplines over four years to realize these transitions, which internally we referred to as psychoactive cinematics. Each of these transition scenes were uniquely complex and brought technical challenges that we could not foresee. The lighting considerations in a scene where we transition from outdoors to indoors in one shot were completely different from a scene where we transition from indoors to outdoors. Throw magical environments and never-before-seen landscapes into the mix. And the tech challenges to realize these design goals were massive. They required a cross-functional group of experts from our animation, cinematics, rendering, visual effects, and environments team, amongst many others on our team, to partner with the lighting team to realize this vision. And we told this vast and rich story through 103 cinematics with a total runtime of four hours, 54 minutes, and 16 seconds. And yes, that is just the cinematic portion of the game. Our average cinematic runtime was two minutes, 52 seconds, and the max number of characters that we had in any one cinematic was 14. It was a Herculean team effort and a race against the clock to finish it. Now, while a large group of our team were pushing the limits of storytelling in games, Another was working just as fervently to expand the audience to, to allow more players than ever before to experience our world. We took player feedback on our 2018 game to heart and God of War Ragnarok shipped with over 70 accessibility features. 
Ragnarok added four new preset menus, each with an off, sum, or full setting option. Vision accessibility, hearing accessibility, motion reduction preset for players with motion sensitivity, and motor accessibility preset for players with a physical or mobility disability. Expanding our options means that players are truly able to be in control of their play and that we could deliver our creation to many more players around the world. Personally, I am in awe of what our creative team with the right technology support behind us can deliver to the world. And if you haven't yet experienced the God of War, the world of God of War for yourself, I hope that this inspires you to check it out. At Santa Monica Studio, we remain committed to relentlessly pushing the boundaries of what is possible in games and delivering mind-blowing experiences that connect deeply with players everywhere. Thank you. Please welcome CEO Polyphony Digital and the creator of the Gran Turismo series, Kazunori Yamauchi. Hello everyone, I'm Kazunori Yamauchi, creator of the Gran Turismo series. So Gran Turismo is a driving simulator series for the PlayStation with over 25 years of history. And today, I will share with you the production philosophy of our company, Polyphony Digital, and the source of reality and its processes for the Gran Turismo series. So this is the thesis we raised when we established the company 25 years ago to quantify the universe and make it possible to calculate. So, and this, this theme hasn't changed today, even uh, 25 years from the beginning. Um, so humanity has always obtained certain laws and insights by observing nature. So from Aristotle to Einstein, if you were to illustrate the methodology of natural science, it would look something like this. So you observe nature thoroughly, and then you use abduction to find its hidden laws. So we want to take this uh, methodology of natural science and apply it to the way we develop video games. And this is the method that we use um, when we uh, go through our day to day creation and production of our video game. And so there are a few additional steps, but the process of development in Gran Turismo is actually the same as the methodology of natural science. So what has changed or is different is that the observation step has been replaced with data capturing using sensors. So you capture the world using sensors, and from that capture, capture data, you can discern simple and elegant equations. So 
So you can do, uh, through that process, you can discern simple and elegant equations such as those of Newton and Einstein. あるいは現在ならばニューラルネットワークを使ってそのニューラルネットワークのネットワークのレイヤーの中に無数の方程式を生み出すことも現在なら可能でしょう。センサーの重要性はいくら強調しても強調しすぎることはありません。えー、僕ら人間が捉えられる光あるいは動きというのはあの実際驚くほど狭いんですね。So, because the range of light and movement that can be sensed by us as human beings is surprisingly narrow than what we normally imagine.、えー、ちょっと映像をお見せしましょう。So, let me show you a movie here. えー、この映像は何かというと、えー、世界初のタイムラプス映像です。So this film is the world's first time lapse image. えー、タイムラプス映像がいつできたかというと、これは1896年です。And it was created back in 1896. えー、作ったのは植物学者、えー、ウィルヘルム・ペファーです。And it was created by the botanist and plant physiologist William p e f f e r この1896年という年は、実は、リュミエール兄弟による世界初の,あの映画の上映、1895年の12月28日のパリだったわけですけれども、それから遅れることたった数ヶ月だったんですね。And the world's first movie by the Lumiere brothers was shown in Paris on December 28, 1895, but it was only a few months later that this movie technology was then applied to natural science and resulted in great advances in the field of botany. 生まれたばかりの映画の技術が、えー、自然科学にあっという間に応用されたわけです。So, you know, えー、この技術は植物学の分野にすごく大きな進展をもたらしました。Created, uh, an, an これまでほとんど動きを捉えることができなかった植物の生き生きとした動きをまあ、新たなテクノロジーである映画が可能にしたんですね。And active movements of plants, which had not been able to be recognized until then, was made possible to capture using this new movie technology. ソニーには多くのセンサーがあります。So, Sony produces many different types of sensors. 超高解像度のセンサー、あるいは超ハイダ,ニダイナミックレンジのセンサー、そして物体の方線と、マテリアルを同時に推定できる変更センサー、たくさんあります。So, Sony produces many different types of sensors:、uh, ultra high resolution sensors, ultra high dynamic range sensors,、uh, polarization sensors that can simultaneously measure the normal vector and material of an object. これらのセンサーが私たちに新たな洞察、あるいは自然界の法則を与えてくれます。And these sensors give us new insight into the laws of nature. So, now let me introduce you to a video showing our production processes in detail. The processes of discovery through observation and experimentation. Is actually exactly the same as the methodology of natural science.
はい、えー、またこのチャートに戻ってきましたけれども、えー、この、えー、プロセス全体において重要なのは、まあ、モデルが計算された結果つまり最終的な成果物が単なるアウトプットではなく、えー、表現にまで消化されている、えー、それがすごく重要な点です。So what is really important in this process is that as a As a result of the model being calculated, the final product must not be just a simple output, but it must be elevated into an expression. So, this process is a very important thing. And human creativity is involved in this entire process. And human creativity is actually required at every stage. How do you capture it? How do you capture it? How do you capture it? So, what do you need to do to capture quality data?、えー、そのデータから自然をどうモデリングするか。How must you model nature from that data?、えー、どう効率よく計算するのか。And how must you calculate that efficiently?、えー、いつだって計算資源って有限ですから、その有限の計算資源から最終的にどうやって最も効果的な表現を得るのか。So, computing research is always limited. So, how do we achieve the most effective expression in the end from the limited computing resources? So, これらすべてのステージにおいて必要なテクノロジー、えー、そしてクリエイターをその内部に持っているということが、えー、ソニーの強みなのではないかと僕は考えています。And I believe that Sony's strength lies in having within it all the necessary technology and creators required for all these stages. えー、そしてここでは計算機科学が単なる数学的なリダクションの体系ではなく物理学や生物学のような発見的なアブダクションベースの自然科学であることを改めて強調したいと思います。So here I want to emphasize that computer science is actually not just a form of simple mathematical deduction, but it is a part of natural science that is based on discovery and abduction just like physics and biology. えー、僕自身は自在なアブダクションこそ、えー、クリエーションの源だろうと思っています。And it is because that I believe that、um, natural and free,、uh, freely controlled abduction is the source of creation.、えー、この会場にいらっしゃる皆さんの中にも自然科学を志,志している方、えー、それから、えー、美しい表現を、えー、目指している方、えー、たくさんのクリエイターの方がいらっしゃると思います。So I believe there are many creators of the future in the audience today who will aspire to pursue natural science and pursue even more beautiful forms of expression.、えー、そうした皆さんと、えー、僕たちは一緒に、えー、仕事をしていきたい、えー、そう願っています。And we hope to work with those people in the future. ありがとうございました。Thank you. Please welcome senior producer for IP expansion at Sony's PlayStation Productions, Carter Swan. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so honored to be here today alongside all these amazing creators. For PlayStation Productions, the last two years have been thrilling. The incredible reception to The Last of Us on HBO based on the PlayStation video game developed by Naughty Dog exceeded all of our expectations. We were also humbled by the reception of the film of Uncharted, also based on the PlayStation game developed by Naughty Dog. We're grateful the film was so positively received by fans and also a hit at the box office of Netflix. We also need to mention Peacock's new hit series, Twisted Metal, which debuted last month based on the long running game franchise by Santa Monica Studios. And now, Gran Turismo, the movie, is getting released in theaters on August 25th. It's a Sony Picture film based on an iconic game developed by PlayStation Studios' Polyphony Digital. It's an incredible film based on the true story of Jan m a r t i n b r o a teenage Gran Turismo player who became an actual professional race car driver. Let's have a quick look. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Well, shut up! I'm not missing my race. Oh, I'm going to puke. Don't poop in my dad's car. Yes, we're not going to jail! <laughs> oh, crap. 
Listen, son. You think you're gonna play a stupid video game about cars and you're gonna become a race car driver? All I ever wanted to do is be a racer. I'm doing it. The ten of you are the best Gran Turismo players in the world. Now is your chance to race real cars. This is insane. It's not gonna work. The guys who race are elite athletes. Your kids are scrawny little gamer kids. That's where you come in. Hmm. So you think you can do the impossible. I'm here to prove that you can't. You get tired, you get sloppy, you get sloppy, you get hurt, and you lose races! <laughs> you puked on my lawn. I know what I'm doing. I'm not afraid. I've raced this track a thousand times in the game. Let me drive it my way. That was actually pretty great. We have a newcomer this year. His presence is shaking the foundation of the sport. This is the major leagues. The other drivers, your pit crew, are going to hate you. Much easier with a joystick, isn't it? <laughs> I can't see anything! I'm not sure if I can do this. Most people can't. I got a feeling you're not most people. If I lose, I lose more than just a race. So I'm not gonna quit. You've gotta prove to everyone that you belong. You've raced it, what, like a thousand times? Now you just gotta do it in real life. Gran Turismo, based on a true story. But I won't stop now. To understand how it was possible for someone to go from racing in a video game to competing in the world's most famous races, you have to flash back 25 years when Kazunori Yamauchi was just on the stage, created Gran Turismo the game. Kazunori-san's vision was to make an ultra-realistic game that uses some of the same skills and techniques as real race car drivers, making it the closest possible simulation to driving on a real racetrack. Back then, all of this realism was an incredibly novel idea. At the time, the prevailing theory was that players wanted supercars, crazy jumps, mechanics, and gameplay that were absolutely impossible in real life. Kazunori-san's commitment to the ultra-realism was groundbreaking, and it was definitely something we committed to when we adapted the game to the big screen. Like the game, the film required the same commitment to realism, which required gr some groundbreaking technology. Our director of the movie, Neil Blomkamp, is known for using CGI to great effect in films like District 9 and Elysium, was in total agreement here. For this film, we wanted to avoid CGI as much as possible we needed to capture the real heat, speed, and danger of racing. We wanted to take the race car movie to a whole new level. It was challenging on many fronts, mainly because of the cameras. To get the reality, we needed new technology. It's very difficult to get cameras with the size and resolution you need to fit into the cockpit and onto the cars. Like the game, we wanted to give you the experience of what it's really like to be on a track. That's when Sony's Venice camera team came into the picture. They invented something called the Venice Extension System 2, which allows you to detach the camera body from the image sensor block. This gives filmmakers new creative freedom. You can get the camera head into tight spaces to film, and it's easy to mount on gimbals and cranes. In our case, we could fit tiny but super high-quality cameras right in the cockpit with the actor. The Venice extension system let us capture the excitement of racing and the real effects of, effects of G-forces on actors. You're experiencing it with them. For an actor, it's not the same as if you're being towed behind a truck or on a stage sitting in front of a green screen. It's very challenging. And for the viewer watching in the theater, you can feel what the actors are going through. Here's a video to give you a better sense of how it all works. The 
VFX isn't necessarily the right way, I think, to convince the audience in this movie. The feeling of speed and a sense that you are undeniably there with the actors living it with them. When Neil decided that his approach was going to be to shoot on the real racetracks with real cars driving at speed, the problem that we had to solve was how are we going to capture that in camera? The Rialto is a detachable front end of the Sony Venice. Fiber optic cable goes to the brains. So you have the sensor up the front, and which makes it a very small unit. So we can put it in tiny places, which is ideal for cars. Venice was chosen for Rialto and dynamic range. Uh, with the dynamic range, you can kind of set the stop, let the car go, and through shadow and cloud and coming out of sunlight and through woodland, the range holds and all the information is still there. I love the sensor, I love the contrast, I love the saturation of the color. I knew I was going to use the Rialto. In a, a cockpit of a LMP2 car or GTR is very small. I needed to find a system that enabled me to put the camera in the cockpit. We eliminate as much as possible of any element that was not conveying speed to us. Camera low to the ground, lots of tarmac. I mean, the speed these cars are going, the heads we're using, we're not using fully stabilized. So it's very raw, very gnarly, especially the nice stuff in the rain. It's very aggressive, raw looking footage is great. I think it will be a fantastic couple of big screens. So that's how we did it. We shot a Sony movie based on a Sony PlayStation game using a Sony camera. So many different branches of Sony worked together on this. Sony Pictures, PlayStation Productions, our camera division, and of course, Polyphony Digital. All of us were single-minded in keeping the vision consistent, strong, and in making sure we honored the groundbreaking realism of car racing and that of the most successful franchise in PlayStation's history. I hope you all get to check out the movie soon when it opens August 25th. We're so proud of the film and the reality of racing we were able to create using all of these groundbreaking Sony technologies together. Thank you. And now, please welcome back to the stage oh. all of our presenters. Okay, uh, well, thank you, Mike Ming and Yamauchi san and Kara for joining me on the stage today. And I hope uh, you've been able to demonstrate you know, Sony's uh, commitment to build the technology that helps to realize your creative visions. We are here for creators. We are here for creators. We want to bring this event to even more creators across the globe. We hope to build a next generation technology together with you. Now, uh, please also join us in room 511 for a series of talks from creators across Sony Group and up there. And thank you for listening and for being here and for creating. Let's work together to pioneer the future of creation. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you, Mike. Yeah.